So I have read a lot of biographies and I have found that the most accomplished and successful individuals I have read about share one thing in common. They all read books. Here is how reading books has impacted their lives. Let's begin with Elon Musk. As detailed in his biography by Ashley Vance, Musk started reading as a young boy while living in South Africa. He used to spend up to eight hours a day reading and finished two books on weekends. Often, while out with his family, he would get lost, only to be found in a bookstore, sitting in a corner, immersed in a book in a trance-like state. When he ran out of books at his school library, he started reading volumes from Encyclopedia Britannica. And do you know where his We Should Go to Mars mission came from? Books. He read works such as Isaac Asimov's Foundation series and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Once, when he wanted to dive into the space industry around the year 2002, he began reading books such as Rocket Propulsion Elements, Fundamentals of Extrodynamics, Aerothermodynamics of Gas Turbine and Rocket Propulsion. Clearly, he would not have been what he is without harnessing the power of books. The second person I have read about is Malcolm X, a prominent African-American leader and a key figure in the civil rights movement in the United States of America. In 1946, due to his involvement in drug trafficking, gambling and other criminal activities, he was arrested and sent to prison for around seven years. When he was released on parole in 1952, he was a completely different man. It was at this time he became who he was. How? Again, books. But how? He began by taking courses in English and then in Latin. Then he gained access to a library in prison. Gradually, he immersed himself in books. He writes in his autobiography that until he left prison, in every free moment he had, if he was not reading in the library, he was reading on his punk. And months passed without him even thinking about being imprisoned. You can find more about his detailed reading experiences in this book from page 176 to page 191. To put it briefly, it was books that transformed him from this to this. Third, Bill Gates. A while ago, he was asked what advice he would give to young people who want to make a positive impact on the world. In a post on LinkedIn, while posting a picture of his younger self, he said, read a lot and discover a skill you enjoy. You can scroll through his Instagram and you'll see pictures of him reading and scrolling through books. In his experience, every book teaches him something new or helps him see things differently. Reading fueled in him a sense of curiosity about the world which he thinks helped him drive him forward in his career and in the work that he does now. Interestingly, back in the 1990s, he frequently went on think weeks. He would take a break from work, retreat into a vacation home, take along a huge collection of books and technical papers. This would help him put his work projects in perspective and think about the future. Fourth, Nelson Mandela, a South African anti-apartheid leader who became the country's first black president. When in the 1960s he was beginning his revolutionary activities, he began reading various books to find out fundamental principles and methods for starting a revolution. From Commando by Danny's Wrights, he learned unconventional guerrilla tactics of the Boer generals during the Anglo-Boer War. He read the works of Mao Zedong, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. He also read the history of South Africa, studied its terrain, its transportation network. Later, whenever he wanted to know something that could not be learned from experts, he would resort to books. In 1962, he was sent to prison and spent 27 years there. He used to read The Economist, pay bribes for gaining access to books and newspapers. The ability to learn from books made him a statesman. And see this video to gauge his acumen. Those of us who share your struggle for human rights and against apartheid have been somewhat disappointed by the models of human rights that you have held up since being released in jail. You've met over the last six months three times with Yasser Arafat, who you have praised. You have told Gaddafi that you share the view on, and applaud him on his record of human rights and his drive for freedom and peace around the world. And you have praised Fidel Castro. I was just wondering, are these your models of leaders of human rights? And if so, would you want a Gaddafi or an Arafat or a Castro to be a future president of South Africa? One of the mistakes 
which uh, some political analysts make, is to think that their enemies should be our enemies. Fifth, Warren Buffett, one of the most successful investors, business magnates, and philanthropists of our time. He's known as an expert for his insights into investing in business. Warren Buffett, the legendary investor, attributes much of his success to his voracious reading habits. He firmly believes in the cumulative nature of knowledge, comparing it to a compound interest. Buffett acknowledges that gaining a knowledge advantage requires substantial time investment, a practice he continues even today. Despite his busy schedule, he allocates five to six hours daily for reading and contemplation, a routine showcased in the HBO documentary, Becoming Warren Buffet. I just read and read and read. I probably read five to six hours a day. I don't read as fast now as, as when I was younger, but I read five daily newspapers. I read a fair number of, of magazines. I read 10Ks. I read annual reports, and I read a lot of other things too. So I, I've always enjoyed reading. I love reading biographies, for example. He emphasizes the accessibility of information, noting that what he reads is available to everyone. His commitment to reading and thinking sets him apart, allowing him to make more informed and deliberate decisions in the dynamic world of business and investments. Sixth, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of Britain during World War II. Reading benefited him in many ways. It was books that exposed him to a rich vocabulary vocabulary and various rhetorical styles contributing to his exceptional command of the English language. This skill was a vital asset in his political career and the aspiration he provided to British people during challenging times. It was books on military history and strategy that bestowed him with strategic thinking, due to which he was able to lead Britain during World War II. It was books that boosted his knowledge of different languages, providing him with a broad international perspective. And this global awareness influenced his diplomatic approach and his ability to navigate complex international relations. It was books that enabled him to become a prolific writer. His readings influenced his own literary style and contributed to his ability to articulate complex ideas effectively, whether in his speeches, articles, or books. At the age of 25, he had already written two books, The Malakand Field Force and The River War, in which he sought to give the British High Command the benefit of his advice in India and the Sudan. He also wrote 43 book-length works in his 72 volumes over his lifetime. He wrote more words than Charles Dickens and Shakespeare combined. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1953, and he was the only British Prime Minister to receive the Nobel Prize in Literature. Seventh, Bertrand Russell, one of my favorite philosophers and writers. Russell's early encounter with Thomas Hardy's The Trumpet Major in Bournemouth and subsequent initiation into Euclidean mathematics at the age of 11 shaped the foundations of his intellectual journey. The influence of his grandmother, who read aloud stories by Maria Edgeworth, expanded his literary knowledge to include words by Shakespeare, Milton, Dryden, Cooper, Thompson, and Jane Austen. This exposure laid the groundwork for his later literary and intellectual pursuits. Despite a sense of loneliness and despair during childhood, Russell found solace in nature, books, and mathematics. If you scroll through through his autobiography, you will find incidents on how some books influenced him and shaped him as a person and a philosopher after almost every other page. It's Anna Frank, a Jewish girl who gained posthumous fame through the publication of her diary as the diary of a young girl. Anna and her family fled to Amsterdam, Netherlands to escape the Nazis during World War II. In hiding for over two years in a secret annex behind her father's business, Anna documented her experiences, thoughts and aspirations in her diary. She writes that books provided Anna with a means to transcend 
the limitations of her physical environment and transport herself to different worlds. Ninth, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan. In his biography written by Stanley Wolpert, the author writes that the most important element in Jinnah's legal education was the two years spent at Lincoln's Inn. Among other activities that were a central part of a lawyer's training, he passed much of his time in London strolling or studying in the reading room of the British Museum, which is considered Mecca for scholars the world over. His sister Fatima Jinnah says about him in the book that even in the days of most active political life, when he returned home tired and late, he would read Shakespeare. This habit boosted his eloquence, shaped his political ideas, composed his personality and provided him with the intellectual stamina to become who he became. Tenth, Helen Keller, an American author, lecturer and advocate for the deaf and blind. At the age of 19 months, she she suffered an illness that left her both deaf and blind. Despite these challenges, she learned how to read and write. In the story of my life, her autobiography, she described literature as her utopia. And it was through books that she was able to visit worlds she might not have otherwise seen or even imagined. With a body that did not allow her to hear or see, she managed to learn how to read books through the help of her teacher, Anna Sullivan, who used the method of tactile signing to communicate letters and words to her. This technique involves making signs into the individual's hand, allowing them to feel the shape and movement of the signs. Later, she used Braille, which is a system of raised dots that can be read with the fingers by people who are blind or who have low vision. When I finished reading her autobiography, I came across her, all her letters in the same book at the end. This is the first letter written at the age of seven. As you can see, she was was not able to express herself articulately. And this is another letter written at the age of 18. This transformation was solely due to books. I can confidently say that any noteworthy individual from history or present whom you may have come across must have benefited from books in some capacity or the other. So if you have not started reading until now, do it today. Let me know your experiences with reading in the comments and do share this episode with like-minded friends and acquaintances.